This video is part 4 in a 4 part series of videos where I attempt to completely restructure the multiverse saga in such a way that I think could have worked better. This video focuses on phase 6 but is actually the second video to do so. I highly recommend watching the first 3 videos if you haven't already to fully understand everything that I've changed, cut out, delayed, pushed forward, or added, and also to understand the general rules of the restructuring I discussed in the first video. The last video, which was part 3, ended with 2026 being capped off with Kang Dynasty ending on a cliffhanger that left all the Kangs dead, the Beyonder as the main villain, as the heroes are all relocated to Battleworld for the ultimate fight. And this leads directly into the epic conclusion of this saga, Avengers Secret Wars, as well as everything surrounding it in the year 2027. The final year in the saga will have three projects before Secret Wars, all either taking place in alternate universes or prior to Kang Dynasty, like how Captain Marvel or Ant-Man and the Wasp came out between Infinity War and Endgame, then, after Secret Wars, there will be two epilogue movies in the vein of Spider-Man Far From Home. Up until now, every year has had three movies and three shows. 2027 will deviate from that rule, as the sheer scale of things this time around does not leave much room for shows. So there will be just two shows, and for the first time ever in this world, four movies in one year. Like how in the real world we had in 2021. With all of that out of the way, let's begin. The 2027 Marvel year will begin just as the year itself does in January as the King Dynasty which was released in November would still be in theaters with a show that was teased in that movie What If Season 2. With the anthology nature of the show I'll simply go over the 10 episodes that I picked for the season and their respective premises. There are actually rumored episodes and it seems to be 10 of them that seem very likely to be true. However one of these episodes was intended for season 1 and in my version came out then. Other episodes I I just think are silly premises like the Thor episode from season 1 so I'm going to get rid of them and like I did with season 1, I'm going to include some single episode replacements for other animated shows that Marvel Studios are producing, as well as one episode that connects to the Kang Dynasty. The season will include three sequel episodes from Season 1, including the only confirmed episode of The Real World Season 2, What If Captain Carter Fought the Hydra Stomper, which is basically the Winter Soldier but in the Captain Carter world. On top of this will be a sequel episode to What If Tony Never Recruited Spider-Man to make up for Spider-Man Freshman Year being relegated to just one episode of What If, and the episode would be called What If Spider-Man Works for Norman Osborn, and would be a Far From Home based episode, although maybe not, it seems like maybe Marvel just isn't allowed to do something like that, they even have to use a different looking Spider-Man, so it could just be a random event that Spider-Man is a part of. Finally for the sequels is What If Zombies Returned, as a replacement for the planned animated series Marvel Zombies, which wouldn't exist in this world, and seemingly is a sequel in and of itself to the What If episode, although hopefully it will have a much darker tone. Some other episodes are rumored ones from the real world season 2, like an episode called What If Hela Convinced Odin to Invade the Nine Realms, which takes place in around 500 AD, and focuses on Wenwu fighting Odin and Hela. There's also What If the Tesseract Came to Earth in the 17th Century, which is an adaptation of Marvel 1602 and introduces the new Native American 17th century superhero, Kohari. Additionally, there would be What If Yondu Had Delivered Star-Lord to Ego, which would probably end with Ego simply winning, an episode called What If the Avengers Formed in the 80s, which is based Based on the rumored episode set in the 80s of Ant-Man and the Wasp fighting Red Guardian, but it would be a little bit more interesting and deviating from the main timeline than that, because that story sounds like something that could have just happened in the main MCU. This 80s Avengers would consist of older versions of current day superheroes like the Hank Bin version of Ant-Man, the Janet Van Dyne version of the Wasp, Isaiah Bradley as Captain America, T'Chaka as Black Panther, Howard Stark as a Mark I looking Iron Man, and Johnny Blaze as Ghost Rider. And finally are a few more episodes that I just wanted to see, including an episode where the Avengers are all killed by Loki and the Shatari during the Battle of New York, leading to the X-Men having to step up and come out of the shadows to save Earth Cold. What if the X-Men fought in the Battle of New York? acting as a sort of episode replacement for the planned X-Men 97 animated show continuation. The second to last episode would be the big one that everyone wants to see, What If The Other Half Got Snapped, an endgame based episode that would maybe need a part 2 in season 3, and finally will be an episode called What If The Watcher Saw The Council of Kings, set concurrently with King Dynasty. The Watcher notices the multiverse shaking events and, like with Ultron, considers whether or not to intervene. 
In the end, unlike with Ultron, he doesn't intervene as he learns to have faith in the heroes he's observed. What if Season 2 releases its 10 episodes between January and March 2027, and is technically just a bit of filler fun between the big event movies that doesn't actually have any bearing on the overall saga? It is, however, in the multiverse saga, and it's about the multiverse. It would have been a mistake not to include it. However, yes, it is kind of filler, which couldn't be further from the case with the next project. The final TV show released in the Multiverse Saga is a six episode miniseries titled Doom, which is about Doctor Doom, who appeared in Blade, Fantastic Four, and the King Dynasty, and now becomes the first villain to get his own eponymous project in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Unless you count the Thunderbolts, which, eh, maybe. Doom chronicles Victor Von Doom's origin story, starting as a poverty stricken child living in Latveria in the 1930s, whose father dies and whose mother's soul is taken by Mephisto, who six years after after his first hints and people theorizing about him appearing in WandaVision, he is finally introduced in the Marvel Cinematic Universe in 2027. Victor then dedicates his life to studying magic and science in order to rescue his mother. On the science side of things, the second episode of the series shows him being accepted into a prestigious American school with a full scholarship in the early 1950s where he meets Reed Richards and Ben Grimm. He and Reed work on a device that can potentially astral project someone into other dimensions. Reed warns Doom that the device won't work, Doom ignores the warning, and the device explodes, permanently scarring his face to the point where he always wears a mask, and Doom blames Reed for all of this. Episode 3 takes place in the early 1960s, and Episode 4 takes place in the late 1960s, and focuses on Doctor Doom being as villainous as he can, as comic booky as he is. He fashions himself a suit of armor that is impenetrable and powerful, he easily overthrows the monarchy of Latveria, becoming the new dictator, and he becomes mortal enemies with the Fantastic Four. Then, Doom comes close to losing his rule due to the Fantastic Four's intervention. However, the events of Fantastic Four take place, and in the late 1960s, let's say 1969, Galactus shows up, the Fantastic Four go after him, and they all disappear. Unbeknownst to Doctor Doom, it was because of Kang. Episode 5 kind of montages through the 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s, as Doom falls in love with a woman named Valeria and is kind of happy, explaining how he's kind of been under the radar for the late 20th century and early 21st century, and Doom realizes that the dark magic that he's using, that he's been using since his youth, is preventing him from aging. However, in the 2010s, Doom's happiness becomes interrupted by the world just simply changing, it's becoming a lot more supernatural and magical, but also, humanity is under constant threat which reminds Doom of his initial mission, something that will be revealed in the finale. Doom actually then blames Valeria for distracting him from his mission, and so has her killed, showing how villainous he truly is, but also how much he believes his mission, which again will be revealed in the finale. The finale then focuses on Doom finally cracking the code to astral projection through dimensions and going after Mephisto in hell. They kind of are evenly matched, but Mephisto has hordes of demons on his way to fight, so Doctor Doom takes the fight back to Earth and traps Mephisto in a specially made cage in his castle. However, in doing so, he leaves his mother defenseless in hell. Defeated, Mephisto offers Doom a deal, which is free me and I shall free your mother. Doom's ambitions get the better of him and he declines, telling Mephisto that he has the power to negotiate here and to give him the power to rule the world, which Mephisto says that he doesn't have the ability to do directly, but he does grant Doom a very specific power upgrade that he says he'll know when to use. Doom then agrees to free Mephisto if he frees his mother. However, it's revealed that Mephisto was the only thing standing in the way of the demons going after his mother, and so his mother died in hell and her soul is gone forever. Doom reflects on his decision, but eventually, right before a flashback shows why he made this decision, he decides that he did the right thing. The show then flashes back to when Doom was a child, revealing that the reason Mephisto went after him in the first place is because he was marked by other higher beings as the future savior of the world, the one man who can prevent the end of humanity and he would have to do so through his rule, which Victor became aware of as a kid and then dedicated his life to fulfilling this prophecy, but also trying to get his mother back. The show then ends with a scene from the King Dynasty where Doom is recruited by Mr. Fantastic and the other conscientious objectors, hinting that Doctor Doom will have a big role in Secret Wars, and yeah, spoiler alert, like I said in my previous video, the movie will begin like how it's marketed with the Beyonder as the main villain, but quickly, Doctor Doom will become the main villain. 
Before we follow up on that prospect, we take a bit of a detour to the one group of MCU heroes who weren't in the King Dynasty, the Guardians of the Galaxy. Guardians of the Galaxy Planet X releases in April and focuses on the new Guardians who were established at the end of Volume 3, joined by their newest recruit, Richard Ryder aka Nova, as the Guardians go to Planet X, Groot's homeworld, to liberate his people from the alien warlords, the Phalanx. This is absolutely the perfect time to do all this because the audience has now gotten to the point where we can hear Groot as English, so either we'd all hear Groot as English, or Groot would be able to translate all the other Groots for us. Either way, the Guardians succeed, but Planet X is left in a bad state as their king is killed, forcing Groot to remain to lead his people, leaving Rocket as the only remaining original Guardian who's active in this universe, even if they're all technically still alive. All throughout the movie, the events of the flashbacks of Volume 3 are immediately followed up on, on further flashbacks showing Rocket meeting Groot for the first time. The movie then ends with the Guardians arriving on another planet on a rescue mission, only for a few square miles of that world to be teleported away to help forge Battle World, bringing the Guardians along with it. And finally, we arrive at Avengers Secret Wars, and god damn, this is a big one. All the marketing, as I said, would focus on Battle World, the dozens of characters who the Beyonder wants to fight each other, and that would be how the movie will start. The Beyonder tells everyone to fight to the death, the winner will get all they desire, and the Guardians of the Galaxy make it to where the action is and join in. Something there is missing, however, as compared to Secret Wars, there is like no villains aside from Magneto, which becomes an issue canonically because the heroes are just refusing to fight. So the Beyonder brings in many villains from across the multiverse saga to fight the heroes and one of these is the Hulk, who restarts his rampage. However, focus then pivots to Doctor Doom, who's taken a very uncharacteristically pacifist approach to this situation. He's just sitting it out, not contributing. Flashbacks to the Kang Dynasty show the scenes of the Beyond from Doom's perspective, as he realizes this is the time to use the power upgrade bestowed upon him by Mephisto during the events of the finale of Doom. He places that piece of his power in the Beyond, and then, cutting back to Battle World, it's revealed that Doom has been doing something this entire time, he's been slowly draining the Beyonder's power. He then opens his eyes, energy starts flowing into him, and he starts to float. Soon enough, all of the Beyonder's power is placed inside Doctor Doom, and immediately from the hero's perspectives, everything goes white. With Doctor Doom now the big bad of this movie and of the saga, Reed Richards would become the hero with the biggest role in Secret Wars, so we would cut to his perspective as he wakes up in the Baxter building back in what seems like the present day. Reed then finds out a few things. For one, the world is under the complete control of Doctor Doom, and the entire rest of the movie takes place in this alternate timeline. Reed finds out that the rest of the Fantastic Four all do have their memories intact, and after conferring with the Avengers, he finds out that everyone who was present at Battle World is in this universe, on Earth, and with full memories of the previous world. This also does mean that Franklin Richards and Valeria Richards do not exist in this timeline. So Reed Richards and Sue Storm, they definitely have to deal with that, but don't worry, they'll be back. With basically no hope against the godlike power of Doctor Doom, Captain America gives a rallying speech to the Fantastic Four and the Avengers, which gives them a sliver of hope, so they split up to recruit any and all heroes they can to fight Doom. Most of the heroes are recruited off screen, the ones that aren't have larger roles, and one of the first heroes they recruit is Doctor Strange. Strange realizes full well they don't stand a chance against the godlike power of Doctor Doom, so he suggests enlisting the help of the Scarlet Witch, who he's been keeping tabs on the entire time, he knows that she's alive. Scarlet Witch will be the only character present in this movie who is a named character from the MCU who wasn't at Battleworld but is alive. It'll be explained that Wanda is a Nexus being, so not only does she not age, but her existence also cannot be affected by anyone, even the Beyonder. So when Doom rewrote reality, Wanda experienced this and noticed how reality is changing, but she wasn't affected. Then after rewriting reality, this led to a big showdown between Doctor Doom and the Scarlet Witch, which Doom did win, but Scarlet Witch put up a big fight. Doom then locked her up in an impossible to escape from magical facility, and so uh, part of this movie is a about a prison break, masterminded by Reed Richards and pulled off by a ragtag group of heroes. During the prison break, Doctor Doom calls out the heroes of Earth with a message saying that he knows that they are here, he knows that they are out recruiting, and he tells them that there is nothing they can do. Speaking directly to Reed, he tells him that if he doesn't come to Latveria in 24 hours, he'll send a nuke to New York City. However, he doesn't tell him to come alone, so he doesn't. 
Seeing no other option, Reed and a ragtag group of other heroes who they've managed to recruit so far arrive in Latveria while the prison break is being concluded and some other heroes are out recruiting. In this confrontation, Doom drops a huge truth bomb, revealing that he rewrote history to have taken over the world since the dawn of humanity, all in preparation for whatever was prophesized that his rule would save the world from. Doom reveals that the year is actually around 100,000 of what would have been AD. He's been ruler of Earth for 200,000 years, and yet still nothing has come that the world would need saving from that only he can stop. Dr. Doom has all the power of the Beyonder, however, he does still have the mind of a human being, a human being who has now been alive for over 200,000 years. So, having gone mildly if not very mad, Doom succumbed to his intense boredom and brought every person who was present in Battleworld back for a bit of a challenge. This does mean that Dr. Doom absolutely 100% won and he was winning for 200,000 years, and the only reason this movie is even happening is because he was bored and he he wanted a challenge, but also he probably wouldn't have done this had he not gone mad. And so, thinking on his feet and realizing that he can take advantage of Doom's madness, Reed convinces Doom that this isn't actually a challenge, that he's still all powerful, and the only way to make this fair would be to share his power with the people he's fighting. Having, again like I said, gone mildly mad and being as arrogant as he is, Doom is incapable of finding any flaw in this logic, and so separates half of the power of the Beyonder across the ragtag group of heroes and an all-out war breaks out with Latveria as the battlefield, as Doctor Doom has an army of Doombots. And you have to remember, this is again a hundred thousand years in a future where Doctor Doom has been ruling for two hundred thousand of those years. So these Doombots are basically all like an Ultron in and of themselves. So the heroes are basically still completely overwhelmed. So let's say Doctor Doom faces off against this huge group of heroes and begins to slip, but then only then activates his insane army of Doombots to help, which completely overwhelms the heroes. Just as all seems lost, every other hero from Battle World appears to aid in this fight with the added help of the Scarlet witch, who adds the necessary firepower to turn the tide to the hero's favors. At some point in this fight, Loki would die, maybe sacrificing his life. I think it's come to the point where Loki should end his time in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, going out as a hero. But also, in the end, all the heroes who have shares of pieces of the Beyonder's power direct their power to the only person who is maybe capable of containing it without losing control, the Scarlet Witch. Wanda, also now going out as a hero, faces off against Doom in a one-on-one -on -one fight while all the other heroes fight the Doombots. Doom is utterly gobsmacked. With all his godlike power, he saw no world in which he can lose because of his arrogance, because of his madness, but also uh, he always had the prophecy to fall back on, it still hadn't come true, and he fully believed that eventually it would. Wanda steals all of the Beyonder's power for herself and leaves Doom powerless, although not dead, and uses it in combination with her own to recreate the world back to what it was, bearing witness to and editing 200,000 years of history. While doing so, Wanda finds a missing part of the world's correct history that relates to herself directly, that was stolen by an unknown force, so she restores it. The X-Men have now been a part of the MCU this entire time, and it's possible other characters have gone through mild changes as well. This causes a soft reboot for the MCU, which Secret Wars is rumored to do in the real world. Finally, Wanda relocates everyone back to their own time and universe, with the sole exception of the Fantastic Four who remain in the present day MCU. Doing all this at once proves too much for Wanda who, in the present day, succumbs to the vast amount of power surging through her and dies in front of her two sons. Mr. Fantastic and Captain America then both reflect on Doom's prophecy, coming to the conclusion that them releasing the Beyonder only for Doom to steal his power was maybe the only way to defeat the Council of Kings, King the Conqueror, the Beyonder, and Doom, meaning in a roundabout way, Doom did save humanity in a way that only he could have. As for the Hulk, I never really intended for him to have a large role. He's kind of been sitting out the saga for a while and came back in this movie. Basically what happened is that he was recruited, he's still savage, but he basically put all of his anger into fighting the Doombots, and in the end Scarlet Witch did put him back in custody. So basically he mostly sat out this saga. It's the next saga where maybe there'll be a Hulk movie, and the Hulk will be more focused on, 
and something that I probably will never go over because it's not the multiverse saga. As for the Avengers, I think this movie should end establishing the new roster, which is a much larger one, like a Justice League Unlimited situation where you have the original Avengers plus the Young Avengers, maybe a few others, to have a very large roster, and that would be confirmed maybe in the end of this movie. In the end, Avengers Secret Wars would release in July 2027, and it would be followed by two more movies which would act as epilogues. The first of the two epilogues is the final movie that brings to a close every single trilogy in the Marvel Cinematic Universe's Infinity Saga with Captain Marvel 3. Now I'll be honest, I don't know much about the stories of Carol Danvers or Captain Marvel or Photon or Miss Marvel, and in fact the story I went for here isn't actually a Captain Marvel story but rather an X-Men story that heavily features Carol but when she was Ms. Marvel. Using this movie as the end of a trilogy, a soft reboot for its main character and a soft launch for the X-Men of the MCU, we have a movie called the Marvel's Rogue Mutants, which fully establishes the now fully recast X-Men, which roster-wise is at a point in time that is similar to what they were in the mid-80s, with the members including Professor X, Cyclops, Iceman, Beast, Jean Grey, Angel, Colossus, Kitty Pride, Wolverine, Nightcrawler, Storm, and Gambit, with this movie adding two more members, both of whom are in the title of the movie, well, oh, kinda. Miss Marvel is a mutant, so she is the catalyst through which the Marvels get entangled in the affairs of the X-Men in the first place, and then there is also Rogue, who initially acts as a villain, then a core plot point, and an honorary fourth member to the Marvels, and then finally a member of the X-Men. Basically, when Kamala is asked to join the X-Men, the Marvels find themselves helping the X-Men fight the Brotherhood of Mutants, which includes Magneto, Mystique, Destiny, Rogue, and a few less important members. During the fight, Rogue manages to touch Carol, draining her of her life force, permanently changing both of them forever. They are now both half as powerful as Captain Marvel has been up until this point. For Rogue, this is a huge upgrade that comes with an overwhelming feeling of power. While for Carol, this comes as a shocking blow, forcing her to go through a bit of an identity crisis, especially since it's confirmed that she'll be aging normally from now on. From there on out, Rogue's adopted mother, Destiny, is the main villain, while the X-Men and Brotherhood of Mutants have smaller roles. Eventually, Captain Marvel inspires Rogue to turn against her adopted mother and join the X-Men alongside Miss Marvel. As Carol learns to accept her new life, even learning to be happy about the fact that she will age normally from here on out as she reconnects a bit with humanity. Captain Marvel is now at the same power level as the comics, while connecting significantly back with her humanity as I think it can't be argued that Carol Danvers is pretty removed from being a human right now, and I don't think people would be able to complain about this being sexist depowering because the next movie will do something very similar with a male hero. The Marvel's Rogue Mutants releases in October 2027. And finally, creating a tradition of sagas on Spider-Man movies, we have Spider-Man Junior Year, skipping sophomore because otherwise the timeline would be a bit too condensed. It's suggested that King Dynasty and Secret Wars took place during his sophomore year at college. Also, I don't love this naming convention in general, I just have no way of predicting what the next home will be, so I won't try to. Spider-Man ended his previous movie at a very dark place, completely disconnected from humanity and a much more brutal hero. King Dynasty gave him the symbiote suit, and what we did see of Spider-Man, there was maybe still him cracking jokes and having very fun interactions with a lot of characters that he wouldn't otherwise have a lot of interactions with, like the other two Spider-Men, Venom, Wolverine, and of course, Deadpool, but he could still be very scary in these movies. This movie will be heavily inspired by Kraven's Last Hunt, probably the most famous story where Spider-Man wears the black suit throughout. This movie will begin with Kraven's backstory and motivation for going after Spider-Man, including the return of Dimitri, now as the chameleon from Far From Home. The plot would go something like this, Kraven, with help from the trickery of his brother the Chameleon, goes after Spider-Man, not necessarily as the most dangerous game, but as an easy picking entry point to the superhero world, as the two of them very much underestimate Spider-Man and are very easily defeated. The fight ends with Peter losing control and going all out, he puts Chameleon in a coma and breaks Kraven's leg. When Peter returns home, he breaks down over what he just did and figures that it was the symbiote influencing him, so he rips it off and it flies into the drain in his bathroom. Wearing a makeshift costume, Peter goes after a villain named Vermin alongside Black Cat. I did say that I don't think that Spider-Man should have more than just the final swing suit and the symbiote suit throughout the entirety of the saga, but I changed my mind. I think that this movie should lead up to him regaining that final swing suit, maybe a slightly altered version of that suit. So he will wear a crappy makeshift suit until then in this movie. Vermin narrowly manages to fend Spider-Man off and escape, and for unrelated reasons, Black Cat 
Pratt does break up with Peter, leading to Peter being at his absolute lowest ever point. And so he decides to hang up the tights and tries to live a normal life to the fullest. Meanwhile, a broken legged Craven who managed to escape alongside his brother with the help of Anna Krivenoff at the end of that fight, sits beside his Comito's brother, coming to terms with his failure. Peter begins to excel at school and becomes friends with Harry and Gwen, the latter of whom develops a crush on him. Craven dips deeper into depression, seeing no way out, he pulls out a shotgun and shoots himself in the mouth. However, at that very moment, the symbiote, attracted to his despair, attaches itself to him, blocks the bullet, and turns Craven into a slightly bulkier looking Spider-Man. Quickly realizing what just happened, Craven goes after Vermin to prove he's a better Spider-Man than the original. A public fight breaks out between Craven and Vermin in Times Square. The news is saying Spider-Man is back. Peter sees the news and is thankful that someone else took up the mantle. However, the fight ends with Craven growing a bit and killing Vermin. While watching the news, Peter realizes that this new Spider-Man has the symbiote, which is how he was able to grow, and he decides that he needs to stop this murderous Spider-Man. Putting back on his makeshift costume, Peter rushes to Times Square and faces off against the new Spider-Man, who he soon learns is Craven. Now the fight is a little bit more even, but Peter is very rusty at this point, so Craven kicks the hell out of him, bringing him to the brink of death before swinging away to bury him alive. While buried and on the brink of death, Peter's life flashes before him, going backwards through the deaths of Tony Stark, Aunt May, and finally, all the way in the year 2027, Uncle Ben is finally introduced in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Peter interacts with this subconscious version of Uncle Ben through whom he reconnects with his mission, his identity, his humanity, his guilt, and the balance he lost sight of, as Peter's true classic origin story is finally showcased, even if a bit, in the MCU. At the very least, it's confirmed. Peter forgives himself for Uncle Ben's death, but realizing that if Craven kills anyone else, it would be his fault, Peter is renewed with purpose. He digs himself out and swings off. Meanwhile, Craven begins to mutate more and more. Before then fully becoming Venom. While Craven is in the wind, Peter actually doesn't go after him. Instead, he tries to reconnect with his humanity a bit and goes to MJ's house to reveal his identity to her. Because of the Secret Wars reset, it's confirmed that Peter can now basically tell anybody his identity and then the spell would be broken without any consequence, so he basically lucked out there. And MJ remembers everything. MJ is also revealed to have been born as Mary Jane Watson after her mother, but she changed it to Michelle Jones Watson because her mother abandoned her. The Secret Wars reset changed this. MJ has been Mary Jane Watson the entire time. Peter and MJ get back together, but while Craven is undergoing his mutation, Peter fashions himself a new suit, the final swing suit with maybe a fully black logo instead of a gold one. Having lost control of himself, Venom attacks the people of New York, whom Spider-Man goes off to protect. A lengthy battle commences and each side is equally matched. Venom is much stronger, but Peter is faster and smarter, and after a brutal fight that leaves Peter bruised and battered with a torn up costume, he tricks the symbiote into thinking that he wants it back before trapping it inside a specially made container, leaving Craven almost completely powerless against Spider-Man. Craven is taken to jail, the chameleon wakes up from his coma and is flown back to Russia, and now in a much happier place, Peter also finds Ned and goes to tell him as well, which is where the movie ends. In the end credit scene, Miles Morales has been by a radioactive spider, Eddie Brock appears as a reporter at the Daily Bugle working for J. Jonah Jameson, but is more so used as a red herring throughout the movie with potential for him to become the second Venom in the future. This movie takes Spider-Man to his worst ever point before breaking him back up, undoing the effects of No Way Home, or at the very least some of them, combines Kraven and Venom into one villain like what they did in Spider-Man Life Story, and finally brings this Spider-Man full circle by introducing the MCU's Uncle Ben and focusing on Peter's original motivation, plus makes M MJ, the actual Mary Jane Watson, all in a darkly toned movie that leads into a much more lighthearted and happy Spider-Man, and in the sixth movie, we just have to do the Sinister Six. And that is it for the Multiverse Saga, 22 movies, 20 shows, which together make up for what I think would have been a fantastic saga. There are a few confirmed projects for the saga that I never mentioned in this video, such as Wonder Man, which I just couldn't find room for, so it will have to be in the next saga. There's also She-Hulk, which I said is delayed, and that's still true, but just delayed beyond the Multiverse Saga, and Vision Quest, which is also delayed to past the Multiverse Saga. And that is it, that brings to an end my four videos long restructuring slash pitching for how the multiverse saga should have gone and how it should go going forward. Let me know what out of all these projects you would like to see the most, what you liked, what you disliked, and if you like this video, make sure to subscribe and thanks for watching.